1. Well, let's begin. First of all, it is an exhibition about the evolution of the image of the world. So we are following a chronological order that we have tried to reflect, since we have to adapt to the rooms we have between things, with the vinyls we have upstairs, and the temporary milestones we have on the floor, we are going to take a tour, I mean we are going to go in and out of the room, but we have to follow a chronological order. And we go back to about the 8th century BC, in reality there is no cartography from that time. What we have are the first written texts that are preserved in Western civilization, which are those of Homer, if Homer existed, which is not clear either. Homer was not a cartographer, but he is considered the father of geography, because in his two works, the Iliad and the Odyssey, he does not speak of cartography, he does not speak of an image of the world, but anyone who has read them can deduce that the world that Homer considered was mainly a Mediterranean world and a flat world, like a flat disc. So I mean, that's where it starts and in fact in antiquity he was considered, the Greek philosophers considered him to be the father of geography. We are in the part of history when the earth was considered to be flat. The first person who is supposed to have made a map, who is known to have made a map of the world was Anaximander of Miletus, and what he thought was the image he put on. It was that of a flat, tripartite disc, dividing the world into the three classical continents of antiquity. We shall see what is missing before he realizes that America, the fourth part of the world, is shaped like a cylinder, a flattened cylinder. In other words, we are in a flat earth concept. Other geographers such as Hecateus or Herodotus, I suppose they are familiar, still think of the image of the earth as a flat disk, but I insist, there is no cartography from this period. What there are are literary references and references to disks representing the earth, etc. These are two maps, as I said, they are not period maps, but they are maps made later in the 19th century, 18th century which represent reconstructions of what the world was thought to be like as seen by the ancients. There is a fundamental milestone in the 4th century BC, approximately, which is the conception of the spherical Earth, which is not immediately known, and by the way I take this opportunity to debunk a hoax, it is not true that in the Middle Ages those who knew geography thought that the Earth was flat. The Earth was known to be spherical, who must have known it, because the common people had other concerns, it was already known at least since Aristotle. Aristotle put forward a series of physical evidences, not metaphysical or philosophical, because at the beginning the sphericity of the earth was something that the Greeks took into account, because it was a philosophical concept. It was the most perfect form, the purest form, it was located in the center of the immobile universe and therefore it had to be spherical. That was already a matter of Plato and some others that is not clear, but Aristotle had already put forward evidence such as, for example, the height of the stars above the horizon varies according to the latitude at which we are. Or in lunar eclipses, the Earth always casts a circular shadow and this can only happen if the figure that casts the shadows is a sphere, which means that with Aristotle there is already physical evidence that the Earth is spherical. Not only that, but Eratosthenes, around 250 BC, measured the circumference of the Earth with a method that I won't go into here, a very simple but rigorous method, which is to observe the inclination of the sun's rays at two different points of latitude. So, thanks to this and knowing that the distance between Alejandra and Siena, which is where he knew that it's solar noon on the summer solstice, the sun illuminated the bottom of a well, that is, the rays fell vertically, he was able to determine the circumference of the Earth with a precision that would surprise us, well, practically what it is, 40,000 kilometers. So I say that this is something that has to be dismantled. So, as far as Greek antiquity is concerned, we don't have any more maps, but we do know that they had cartography. 2. We continue to move forward and already in the Hellenistic period, a fundamental figure appears who is Claudius Ptolemy who is considered the father of scientific cartography. Ptolemy established the principles of cartography, this is in the year 150 of our era approximately, because he introduced cartographic projections, he was the one who established the orientation of maps to the north, the networks of meridians and parallels and not only that, 
Ptolemy explicitly in his most famous treatise which is Geography, it is titled like this, well, it is titled differently in Greek, but it can be translated as Geography, he says that the maps, successive by copy, tend to the greater dissimilarity of the original, for what he establishes a method in which by coordinates it is not necessary to resort to the copy of anything, but that we always go to the originals. In the end, geography is a list of 8,000 points with coordinates of the known world, of which about 500 correspond to Hispania, which is the Iberian Peninsula, because he divided the world, let's say, into 26 zones or 26 maps. Well, he also designed two projections of the world, two projections to represent the world, which are the first and the second, this is the Ptolemy Conic, this is a facsimile of a Greek Ptolemy from the 15th century. There are no surviving copies of geography before 1300, but this is in Greek and is the closest thing to what Ptolemy's original map of the world would have looked like. I don't know if anyone recognizes anything, these are 180 degrees of longitude, that is, half a. Wait, these are 63 north, these are 16 zones, here is the peninsula, here are the Canary Islands. These six points, which he called the Fortunate Islands, for the Greeks, who in ancient times were also the origin of longitudes, the world began in the west in the Fortunate Islands, that was what was known and that is one of the reasons why the Zero Meridian was passing through the Canary Islands, practically until the 20th century. This was the Indian Ocean, which he considered to be a closed ocean and well, it is commendable that within the data he had in the year 150 he had much better cartography than, for example, what he had in the Middle Ages afterwards. Then we will recover Ptolemy's geography because although it was written in the year 150 when it was recovered and really influenced history and not only the history of cartography, the history of the world, it was in the Renaissance, in the 15th century. 3. The Middle Ages arrived and with the fall of the Roman Empire there was a general setback in all the arts, sciences, techniques, everything, and very simple maps began to appear, which were not very rigorous and schematic, the T and O maps, as we see here, which in the end are discs, in which a tripartite earth appears, the design is due to Saint Isidoro of Seville. Well, he was one of the great men of letters, not very well known in Spain, but well known abroad and he described in one of his works, the etymologies, there was also a part of geography and he said that half of the world was occupied by Asia, which is this, this is Europe and this is Africa. And the maps were oriented to the east, this with different versions are these T in O maps. There in that display case, there is a facsimile of one of the etymology codices preserved in the Spanish National Library from the 10th century and you can see in the upper corner one of those T and O maps that St. Isidore introduced. But I insist, it is not that they did not know. That the earth was spherical, it is that they were not interested in it because the point of view was religious, in fact, they were maps centered in Jerusalem, oriented to the east, which was where the earthly paradise is and with a very Christian point of view. They didn't rigorously represent geography because that wasn't their interest, they shouldn't be seen as that. 4. A variant of these maps are the Beatos, by Beato de Libana, a monk from the monastery of Santo Toribio de Libana, who worked on a work, which was the Apocalypse of St. John and designed a map of the world to illustrate it, to illustrate the preaching of the apostles. Here we have, 14 manuscripts have been preserved, not the original, which is from the year 776 and they are all similar and have a similar scheme to that of St. Isidore, it is a tripartite world. This axis which I have forgotten to say is the Mediterranean, they are still oriented to the east, the earthly paradise with Adam and Eve, the four rivers that flow from paradise, this is Europe, this is Asia and this is Africa. Here a fourth Antipodean continent appears, which they also speculated about the existence of a fourth Antipodean continent, i.e. in the South Symmetrical. To ours which in addition, and this for religious reasons, as it did not appear in the Bible and there was an impassable ocean, in the Torrid Zone, the ancients knew that when you sailed to the south it was very hot and they thought that there was what they called the Torrid Zone around the equator, where the water boiled, the ships fell apart, the people died of thirst, so they couldn't reach that Antipodean continent. Monsters are always drawn, because they are not the sons of God, 
the sons of God or the image and likeness of God are those who arrive after the universal flood, when the earth is repopulated by the three sons of Noah, Shem, Ham and Japheth, who by the way are usually associated with the three parts of the world in the maps of T in O, Shem, Japheth and Ham, because those are map designs. The peninsula is that here, from here in this beato, which is Burgo de Osma, the road to Santiago de Compostela. The Cathedral of Santiago, Santiago de Compostela, had a very important relevance, because it is one of the poles of the world, for religious reasons, together with Jerusalem, which used to be in the center. Well, these are the Beatos, and here you can see how, from an original, there are rectangular ones with oval corners, round ones, in short, this is what Ptolemy was already warning about in the second century. Maps, by successive copies, tend to the greatest dissimilarity, let's not do this, let's make a table, let's mathematically systematize cartography and make what is modern cartography, that is, this way of representing the world and this concept is the one we use today, in navigators, we go with longitudes and latitudes, we have not invented this, the Greeks knew it and applied it centuries before Christ. In the Muslim world, there were also maps similar to the medieval Christian ones, but they used to be oriented to the south, this is one of them, from the 10th century, and in this case it is more difficult to see, this is the Mediterranean, I said this is the south, this little triangle is Europe. Because each one represents what is most interesting for him, for the Islamic world, the most important thing was the Islamic world, so Europe is this small part here, sometimes Al-Andalus is overrepresented, and there are three islands that are usually Crete, Sicily, and Sardinia, sometimes Cyprus, but they have nothing to do with what we consider most important, the Nile, and this is the Indian Ocean, which they knew. Well, here each one represents what they consider most important. 5. We continue advancing in the Middle Ages and we see another example of a mural world map, medieval, which is the Hereford, this is a facsimile, from the 19th century, also you can see that it is in small pieces because it is folded, the original is in the Cathedral of Hereford in England and it is from around the year 1290. Again we see the characteristics that we have mentioned, circular disc, Jesus Christ, at the top, scenes of the final judgment, the good ones on the right going to heaven and the bad ones going to hell, here you can see them chained and so on, while I say, the Mediterranean, the Black Sea, the Sea of Azov, the Nile, the Red Sea and this is very common represented in red in medieval and renaissance cartography and this hollow here is where Moses opened the waters for the people of Israel to pass through, as you can see it has a very religious focus, this part here is the peninsula, you can see the current. Toponymy, this is the Strait of Gibraltar, then the Strait of Hercules with the Pillars of Hercules. The presumed pillars of Hercules which are Gibraltar and Mount Echo in Ceuta, which is what the sailors saw when they arrived and that legend that there was no more there in the time of the Phoenicians, they didn't want anyone to sail further afield so as not to trample on their commercial interests, here we can see, as I said, another image of the medieval world and here one can lose oneself for an hour looking at legends and all this is transcribed, there is bibliography on the subject and simply so that we can see an example of a medieval world map on a wall. 6. Around the time of this map, the compass was introduced in the Mediterranean and the nautical charts appeared, with the nautical charts it was already possible to plot courses and estimate distances and with courses and distances and taking the points of the coast and drawing very precise profiles of the coast. What happened is that this was the erudite cartography which curiously enough was the least precise, and the practical cartography of the merchants, of the seamen, of the common people, was much more precise. Because if a nautical chart is not accurate it is worthless, if you are going to sail with a world map of this style you are not going to get anywhere and if you sail with a nautical chart and it is not well done you run serious dangers, then these charts appear, this is a facsimile of the first known one of 1.290 which is the Pisan chart so called because its origin is in Pisa, here you can't see it. Very well, but all the nautical charts or many of them used to be made on parchment, you can. See the skin of the animal with nets of courses because the objective was to navigate and you can see that is what interests is the coast. What appears are the coastal profiles that were not improved until the 18th century when the marine chronometer was introduced, 
these medieval nautical charts had the same precision that until the 18th century, it was not improved. We see that toponymy and place names are perpendicular to the coast, the interior is empty because it is of no interest and if it is filled with something it is decoration, it is not information, well in this case here there is precisely a piece of the Cantabrian coast as what was well known was the Mediterranean and the Black Sea, this part of Europe including the British Isles is very faded, but the really interesting ones are here, the ones that are taken from the experience in this one from the Strait of Gibraltar more or less, the Spanish Levant, the French coast, North Africa etc., and these were the commercial interests of the Genoese. Florentines, Venetians and Mallorcans because the main cartographic school of nautical charts was in Majorca. 7. And in fact, the most important work of this type of nautical charts is this, which is the Atlas of Cresques, the author, or the Catalan Atlas, which is called like this, in reality the school was not Catalan, it was Mallorcan, but as this was baptized in the National Library of France, the toponymy is in Catalan, the toponymy is in Catalan, one thing this map was not made to put on a wall, it is well put like this, if you see it from here you will see that the toponymy is upside down. It is not that it is upside down it is that in the map it did not turn, it was you who turned to see the map correctly, that is to say, it was not oriented and here you can recognize the shape of the peninsula perfectly, you can even recognize Africa and the Canary Islands, we are in 1375, these are separate tables and pieces of parchment stuck on top, it is very decorated and we see all the characteristics of the nautical charts, by the way, it is the first time that a windrose appears in the Catalan atlas here, it is divided into pieces and the Mediterranean arrives which is the rigorous part and from here on it is all fictitious, well, not fictitious, based on descriptions in the accounts of Marco Polo etc. and we see that it is full of information but this information is not rigorous it is decoration above all these were copies for noble people let's say again the reddest we see here in red again that stripe that signifies the passage of the people of Israel and legends for example the Magi going after the star with their gifts. That is to say that it had great religious content, one important thing the nautical charts, the flags of the powers that dominated the coasts, nobody was going to find what they didn't expect, but they used to represent them and Majorca is very prominent, very typical in cartography, normally the author highlights the area to which it belongs, these insertions in. The originals were in gold, well we see there the flag of Aragon etc., well I say here is the Mediterranean, it is more or less rigorous and from here on it is based on stories, but it is one of the first times that the Pacific Ocean appears, something that Ptolemy didn't know for example. 8. Well, we continue advancing a little before these nautical charts, this is an example of medieval Islamic cartography, it is the map or the Rogerian tabula of Idrisi, first it is oriented to the south so to see the peninsula you would have to turn it around, Idrisi did not make this map but in a treatise he included partial maps by climates, so if you put all this together, this is a facsimile and in this case it is placed facing south, we would get a map similar to this one, this is an example of a cartographer from Ceuta who worked for the King Roger II of Sicily who called him to make a map of the known world, with all the knowledge that existed and he made this which in honor of the patron is called the Tabula Rogeriana, it didn't have a sequel, let's say nor did it have much influence on the history of cartography, but it is an example of Islamic cartography made for a Christian king of the known world that covers more or less the same time, well, a little before a century or two before the Catalan Atlas. 9. This is an example of a fusion, this is from around 1450, let's move on a little, this is another world map in Catalan also from the Majorcan school which is in the Estense University School of Medina and you can see that what they have done is to fuse the design of the medieval world map with the nautical chart, the part of the Mediterranean is taken from a nautical chart, it is perfectly visible and precise, as is the surrounding area. Like the Catalan atlas, like the world maps, legends of different kings, etc. but nothing precise, here a sketch of the Gulf of Guinea and this is not dated, again the Red Sea in red, this is very common, we can see that part of the coast of Africa is correctly drawn, we can date this chart or this extensive world map knowing the advances of the Portuguese along the African coast, we can know that as far as the toponymy is correct and the coast is correct, 
the date of the map is around the year 1450. It is one of the ways of dating because it is not dated, as I said, this is what is called a transitional world map. 10. We are approaching the end of the Middle Ages and this is the, let's say, the swan song of medieval cartography of the Mapamundis, which is the world map of Fra Mauro, it's a facsimile, it's in the Marciana Library in Venice, its format is even a little bit bigger, I don't know if anyone is able to recognize anything after all this time, but again it is oriented to the south, it is from 1459, this proves once again that the orientation of the maps to the north is a relatively modern conventional thing, it has not been like that all the life, in the Middle Ages they were oriented, normally to the east, the Muslims to the south and east as he has brought, Muslim information possibly inspired by information from Arabs, that's why he knows the part of the Indian Ocean, it is oriented to the south, the usual, the part collected by the nautical charts is perfectly traced, it has a lot of information, and it was a commission for the King of Portugal. The King of Portugal just before his exploration of Africa, because he wanted an image of the known world and as I said, from Moro's world map, which is also a cosmology, if you look at it, it has a Ptolemaic astronomical system with the Earth in the center, the planets, the fixed stars, etc., and the last sphere, which was the primus mobile, which moved everything, the Aristotelian elements, Earth, water, air, and fire, an image of the earthly paradise and the four rivers that flow from it, taken from the Bible and a zonal map, so, well, here we can clearly see that they knew perfectly well that the Earth was spherical. 11. Well, Ptolemy's geography arrived in Europe, in Florence in 1390-something, in the Renaissance, but the fundamental milestone was when it was translated into Latin in, in 1476, and these Florentine codices started to appear and that's when in Florence, or in Italy in general, they realized that what Ptolemy did in 150 was much better than what many of them were doing in the 15th century, in the year 150 was much better than what many of them were doing in the 15th century. So Ptolemy's geography was adopted and here we have an example of the world map of those Florentine codices, similar to what we had in the first projection, we see it here in the second projection. Well, here is a panel explaining the origin of Ptolemy's geography for those who want to see it later, and as I said, there are important milestones in the history of evolution, in the image of the world, here we have put the introduction of the printing press, around 1455, because everything that was handwritten until then, I know that now we see it as a very simple thing, but I compare it to the internet, the diffusion that the printing press allowed on its scale is a fundamental milestone, although it seems like a very silly invention, because putting metal type, it doesn't seem very scientific, but it was a revolution. Explorations continued, the Portuguese in 1410 had begun to explore the coast of Africa, I don't want to expand on this, they didn't do it by chance. With the fall of Constantinople, the Mediterranean was blocked, the blockade of the Mediterranean prevented all the goods coming from the east, especially spices, from passing through because they were in the hands of the Turks, what did the Portuguese do? They began to look for the route to India through other places, for commercial reasons, all of which led to the round-the-world voyage, which we will see later. The origin of the round-the-world voyage, the motive, was not to discover the world, it was to reach the Spice Islands, the thing is, well, it was the round-the-world voyage, but, in short, that was not its origin. A fundamental milestone, in 1488, in that slow journey of centuries, step by step of the Portuguese, the Cape of Good Hope was rounded, and then the Ptolemaic image that the Indian Ocean was closed, was dismantled, the Portuguese. Soon after arrived in India, well, well, here is this milestone, and this is the first map by Enricus Martellus, from 1489 to 90, where Africa is represented as what it is, that is, we also see that the toponymy reaches there, this is still unknown, more or less, a few years later India is reached, Calicut, not Calcutta, which some people confuse with Vasco da Gama. 12. This is a perfect facsimile of that map that is there, this is the Urbina's Latin Codex 274 that is in the Vatican Apostolic Library, well, 
it is Ptolemy's Florentine geography from the 15th century with its 26 regional maps and the map of the summit. If you look at it, it imitates parchment, it imitates the binding, it is with gold leaf, these codices were very expensive, they were normally dedicated to the Pope, to a duke or to very important people, with the printing press this became a little more accessible, to more people, although it was still very expensive, so this is a facsimile of a geography by Ptolemy from the 15th century, Florentine. 13. Another fundamental milestone, the discovery of America and the first map that represents America in history, in the chart of Juan de la Cosa that is kept in the Naval Museum of Madrid, is this one that is here, it is a real chart so to speak, where we see that all the information from the year 1500 Portuguese and Spanish and from the nautical charts is right in this part here. What some say could be the meridian of Tordesillas, which is the Gulf of Mexico and the discovered islands. Of Cuba and the Dominican Republic or Cuba and Hispaniola, in fact we can see Castilian flags, it is the first time that America is represented. The thing is that Columbus died convinced, or so it seems, he was also interested, that he had reached the Indies because his project was to reach the Indies through the West, that was precisely the alternative that the Spanish sought, the Portuguese tried to reach the Indies through Africa and that is where. The conflict arose, the Tordesillas Treaty came and they said, because we are worth it, half four. You, and half for me of the world, well, the Pope said that everything west of Africa was for Castile and eastwards was for Portugal and everything westwards from 370 leagues from the island of Cape Verde was for the crown of Castile and the problem was that nobody knew where it touched the other side of the world, when the problem of going round the world arose, because the Moluccas, the islands of the species, were right on the anti-meridian and there was no way of knowing which part it belonged to. 14. This is the first one that comes out with the Tordesillas line, it is a Portuguese royal register, this information was very secret, it is from 1502 and here you can see perfectly what it was like, all this is already known, Africa is known to the Portuguese, Vasco da Gama arrives at Malind more or less, jumps the Indian Ocean and arrives at the Malabar coast, you can see that there is toponymy here, and all this is known, but not at first hand, by the Portuguese, this is a Portuguese chart, I insist once again, the Red Sea, in red, a little road there which is that road and within that the interior was symbolic, we can see Jerusalem, very important, disproportionate, Venice, inspired by the nautical charts and then, so that you can see to what extent the author, or to whom it is dedicated, had transcendence, the castle of Mina, San Jorge de Mina, that is a small fort, but for the Portuguese it is very important because the first factory they established in Africa, in Guinea to bring gold and slaves, in Guinea to bring gold and slaves, they were the ones who introduced slavery and human trafficking, by the way, I don't know if there are any Portuguese around here, this is history, for this it will be very important, and as I said, something that in reality is a small fort, is represented with the same importance as Jerusalem. 15. This is a very important map in the history of cartography and of the world, and for the Americans, and specifically the Americans, it is extremely important, as I have already said. Columbus said he had reached the Indies and made those who accompanied him swear an oath and so on, but it wasn't really until 1503 that the idea spread that what the Spanish and Portuguese had discovered or were traveling through was a new world, some people still thought it was Asia. Until when? until Amerigo Vespucci, who made four voyages, two with Spain and two with Portugal, and some say that he didn't make any and that he was a bit of a troll, which also has to be said, but well, it has gone down in history that he made four voyages and in one of them he describes that what he has sailed, he claims to have sailed to 52 degrees south, which is impossible, in other words that is a lie, one of his fantasies or exaggerations, which is obviously not the Indies, it must be a new world and he calls this letter Mundus Novus and it is published thanks to the printing press, otherwise it would have remained a letter to a private person who was his patron, this letter reaches the hands of the cartographer who made this map, the German Martin Waldsmuller, and he erroneously attributes to Amerigo the discovery of this new world that he calls the fourth part of the world, and in the treatise that accompanies this map he says, why not call this new world a new world?
Why not call this New World America in honor of Amerigo? And he says, and not Amerigo, because Asia, Europe and Africa have women's names, so it's not right to call it Amerigo, let's call it America. This map, and I mean this literally, is what gives America its name today, this map. This sign here is the one that gives America its name, this name was consolidated from this map, the Americans, the only printed copy is known to be a mural made up of 12 sheets in 12 wooden blocks and xylographs, and the United States acquired it from Germany, because this map appeared in 1901, it was known to exist, but it was a very filmy story, in the basement of a German castle, I don't know, how about that, it was discovered in Jesuit, well like the name La Rosa a little bit, and the map appeared and they sold it to them as a state sale, and the Americans call it the birth certificate of America because of this, because it is the document that gives America its name. I mean there is only one known copy. Right now the original is on display in the Library of Congress in the United States, they have it in an armored urn, it is filled with argon, which is a noble gas, as it is a noble gas, it does not react chemically, nor does it allow life inside, so it is protected against chemical and biological deterioration. For us, who are not Americans, at least most of us, it is a very important map in the history of cartography because it is also the first one that represents America as a continent separated by an ocean, not yet discovered in theory by Europeans, and it is also the first representation, or one of the first ones of Japan, here, if you look, it is Ptolemy's map enlarged, and in fact it is the first map in double hemisphere in history, and this is the transition from medieval geographical thought to the modern age. The world, now, from this map, no longer fits in one hemisphere, the tripartite world that we have seen, and he adds. Claudius Ptolemy, the Alexandrian cosmographer, puts there his world, the old one, and Amerigo Vespucci and his world, the new one. This is where they add, in other words, the vision will be broadened and the world will be more or less known as it is. This map has a lot, you could be talking about it in the middle of the day, but we don't have it so it's a very well-known map. Let's move on, we have a panel there called the Great Oceanic Explorations, from there they arrive in a series of explorations, a few years later the Round the World Voyage, which we have just finished the ephemeris, because it was in 1519 to 1522, well in 2022, we have had an exhibition that we have right now in Seville set up, it has visited several places. And in the first round the world voyage what was discovered, let's say, was not the shape of the earth, which I've already said was something that was perfectly well known, but its real circumference, and in fact, the objective was not to sail around the world, it was to reach the spices. I mean, it's a fascinating story, but that's in another episode, it's the other exhibition. 16. This is a codex by Battista Agnes, an Italian from the middle of the 16th century, where on that world map, on that oval-shaped world map, even that circle is traced. Well, what is discovered here is the size of the earth, by inheritance of Ptolemy and it is another of his, shall we say, important influences in history, the earth, and I'm not going to get too much into this, was about a quarter smaller, 30% smaller, than it really was. That jumped into the Renaissance when Ptolemy's geography was adopted as the official science, what they thought, and that's why Columbus thought he had reached the Indies, was that the Earth was much smaller. What was found on the first round-the-world voyage was that the Earth was much larger, not that it was round, spherical, I already knew that, I say that because it is sometimes heard about it even in relatively authoritative documents. What was discovered was an immense Pacific Ocean, which was unknown, and which by the way caused an enormous mortality rate, from 1 out of 260, 18 returned. And from 5 ships, 1, that's more or less all there was to say. 17. This map is very important, it comes by inheritance, and it is one of those that consolidate the name America. Here you can see how in this map from 1522, of which we have two originals at the Institute, and it is a copy of the Waldsmuller edition of the Ptolemy geography. Well, America appears here, it is the third printed map in history where the name America appears, by successive copies, 
the name is consolidated. And one thing, Waldsmuller only used the name America on that map. Later, he realized, or was made to realize, that he had made a mistake. And on successive maps, he never again called America America. It was the others who copied and consolidated it, he called it Terra Nova, Terra Incognita, he even put on the maps what will be called a disclaimer, in Latin it said, this land and the adjacent islands were discovered by Christopher Columbus, Genoese, by order of the King of Castile. In case it had not been clear that I removed the name America, I put this text, that is to say that Waldsmuller only used the name America and nevertheless he was right, because 500 years later, the name has been kept. 18. Another facsimile of the image of the world around 1540 after the round the world voyage is the Munster cosmography, we have two originals, an Italian and a German edition in the Institute. And you can see that oval map, and you can see how printed cartography was not yet able to make the progress of manuscript cartography that we are going to see later, because the good information was in the Spanish and Portuguese courts. And this information, in the case of Portugal, leaking it was punishable by death, because it was extremely valuable from a commercial point of view, for example. Here we see Temistitan, that is, Tenochtitlan, that is, Mexico, which is close to the coast of Asia. And Sepangri is right next to Mexico, because in this year the commercial cartography, which is the one that is printed and disseminated, had not yet reached, let's say, that conception of the real size of the earth, which those who knew it kept secret. And here you can see, Mexico is next to Asia, although we know that it is a separate continent. Well, the Strait of Magellan, of course, this map is the first one where the name Pacific Sea appears on a printed map, a name given to it by the Magellan and Elcano expedition, by the way, and there was nothing peaceful about it, but well, they found calms, even a non-existent strait, very typical in the cartography of that time, where it says in Latin, through this strait, a path opens up towards the Moluccas. They thought that there was, in addition to the southern passage, the northwest passage, which does not exist. In fact, the whole Magellan expedition, what they were trying to do. Well, I'm going a bit off here, when they realize that America is a continent, what it becomes is an obstacle. They say here is an enormous mass of land that there is no way of getting through to reach the Indies, so the race is not to see what is in America, it is to see how to get around America, then the discoveries in South America, the gold, etc., will start to arrive, but at the beginning it was something that was not valuable. 19. A royal register, facsimile, preserved in the Spanish Society of New York, from the year 1526, practically after the first documents showing the discoveries of the first voyage around the world. Firstly, what was a royal register? It was a secret document, which was only held in the contracting house in Seville, where the world was being completed with the explorations. Every pilot who left Seville was obliged to take the charts given to him there and he was obliged to return them all, if he returned, and he was obliged to undergo what is called a debriefing, which is to arrive there and be interrogated and be told, give me what you have charted and we will add it to the Padron Real. This, of course, was top secret. Not so secret, because some, like Juan Vespuccio, Amerigo's nephew, copied it and then sold it around, but well, in theory it was secret. These were gifts that the king, Emperor Charles I, gave to monarchs from the rest of the world to dignitaries, as a propagandistic reason to explain on a map that the Moluccas, which was disputed, whether they were on one side or the other of the anti-meridian and was where the spices were, the cloves, only came from the Moluccas and it was a very expensive commodity. Well, what it did was the meridian of Tordesillas, this scheme of the standards is the same. Spain, Portugal, Portuguese flag, Castilian flag, Spanish equivalents, ships with the Castilian flag, the Moluccas with the Castilian flag and a legend that says here, on this island, all the cloves and spices of the King of Castile grow. This is a legend that he gives to other dignitaries, this pattern is repeated, not only that, the map is 360 degrees and a little bit more, because this extreme that not by chance the Moluccas are in this half, it is not by chance, if it is not clear, 
the map reaches here, I draw them again here, I put again the Castilian flag, limit, here grows the clove and the spice of the king of Castile. There are several copies of charts, this is one of the ones I like the most, the one of Vespucio of 1526. The imperial coat of arms over the new territories in America, of course the Red Sea in red, etc., but it is a nautical chart in essence, with Ptolemaic reminiscences still. 20. Another royal register, this one from 1529, and here, as always, meridian of Tordesillas, half the world, half the world with its flags, these ships that are represented here, you can see them here, those that are here say, I'm going to Maluco, I'm going to Maluco, I'm going to Maluco, I'm going to Malucas, by the way, by an illegal route, because the Spanish couldn't do that, in other words, illegally I'm going to Maluco, because I shouldn't go that way. And then all this says I come from Maluco, I come from Maluco, I come from Maluco, I come from the Moluccas with the spices, then the king sold the rights in 1529, because he wasn't interested in keeping it and wanted the gold for other things. And also, he pulled the great scam of history, because the Moluccas were on the Portuguese side, but King Charles said, as we don't know, but I know for sure that they are on my side, I will pawn them to you, and in the future, when? It is proven that we have the technical means to prove that they are on my side, I will buy them back, he couldn't buy anything back, he sold them for 350,000 gold ducats, which he sold them for 350,000 gold ducats, which was the price of the Moluccas, he couldn't buy them back, he sold them for 350,000 gold ducats, which he spent, I imagine, on wars, and he pulled off the swindle of the century, to the Portuguese of course, because they were on his side. Here appear the Moluccas, Castilian flags, and not only that, the maps were propaganda tools, China, where the Spaniards had not set foot, has a Castilian flag. When the time came, we could claim that we had been there too, but the area in conflict was this one, which is right where the anti-meridian more or less passes, but in reality the Moluccas were in the Portuguese hemisphere. 21. This is a little bit out of context from 1587, these are three images so we can see how the cartography, sometimes it is symbolic, of a German clergyman, Bunting, where you can see, for example, the conception of the world in a cloverleaf, the tripartite world, Jerusalem in the center, Europe, here he puts it. Europe, Asia, Africa, Jerusalem and the design, of course, here America had already been discovered 100 years ago as the tripartite design is annoying to him, all beautiful with the clover of the coat of arms of Hanover and I don't know what, and here he puts America with a sticker, so that it doesn't show too much, and he puts America as the new world. In other words, he puts America in as if to say, look, look, what I wanted was the shamrock and then I put something else in there that has been discovered. Europa, the first part of the world in the form of a virgin, Europa, you see, is a queen or a virgin if you like. And it is no coincidence, this is an allegory, even to dignify the monarchy of the Habsburgs, the House of Augsburg, because if you look at the head of Europa, it is Hispania, which is no coincidence, here it says Navarre, but you can't read it. A Christian orb in Sicily and the heart in Bohemia, in other words, this is a symbolism, at a time when the Turks were putting pressure on the Mediterranean, to affirm, firstly the Christianity of Europe against the Turks, and then the religious political leadership that the Augsburg monarchy had over the rest of Europe. And this is another example, Asia, to all this, Europe, the first part of the world, which is curious because the first part of the world for the ancients was not Europe, it was Asia. And here, that also means Europe in the first, Asia, second part of the earth in the form of Pegasus. Well, here you can see a representation, in the form of a Pegasus horse, this is the Mediterranean, this is the Nile Africa, these are alternative symbolic representations of the world. So, we are going to continue here and we are going to get to what we are going to know. 22. After the first round the world voyage, it was known that there was a strait, but it was not known what lay beneath it. There were only intuitions, because nobody bothered to go further south. The first strait that appeared was obviously sailed. 
The Magellan Strait is a very dangerous strait, where there were many accidents, almost all of them. Well, the Spanish discarded that route as viable, because it was catastrophic. In fact, in the second expedition it ended in total catastrophe, in which Elcano died, by the way. And what they were already doing was trading with America and the Indies through the East Isthmus of Central America, they did not pass through here. However, there was still a theory, which I won't go into here, that came from the Greeks, that in order to balance the masses of the earth, there is a southern continent, so in Tierra del Fuego, here it says Terra Australis non cognita, southern. Or southern land, not yet known. Until 1616, up to 100 years after Magellan and his expedition. Passed through the strait, nobody verified that the island of Fuego was an island. And Tierra al Fuego was still called Tierra al Fuego. And here you can see how for a century people continued to think that there was a huge southern continent going further and further south. When you round the Cape of Good Hope in 1488, the southern continent goes a little bit further down. When they rounded Cape Horn, the Dutch, in my 1616, it was already going further down. And with Captain Cook, it was completely dismantled because he made a very southerly route and there was no southern continent here. That's an example of what was going on. 23. This one, which is already from 1700, you can already see that the Dutch rounded Cape Horn in 1616 and depicted Tierra del Fuego as an island, which is what it really is. Here there have already been landings in Australia around 1640, even Tasman's voyages, which is the one that let's say discovers or explores a large part of the coast of Australia, but this piece is missing, this is Tasmania. That we're going to see that this gap, this is an example of a nautical chart. Well done, because what is not there is not invented, we don't paint like the Middle Ages. 24. So, we continue to move forward here, we are already in the 18th century, two world maps, very beautiful, the typical map in two golds which, by the way, is the motif of our next exhibition, whoever wants to, from April 26th in Madrid, in the National Geographic Institute, will have an exhibition of maps in double hemispheres. And this year's calendar is related to this. Everything is already there, but we still need to map this part, the Bering Strait, this part of the coast of North America and part of Australia. As we can see, these were works of art rather than maps and all the information around them, all the gaps were filled with allegorical scenes of the four seasons, whoever is curious should look for the twelve signs of the zodiac here, for example, mythological figures, etc. Another example, in this case, with celestial spheres, astronomical diagrams, about eclipses, etc., phenomena such as volcanoes, tides, whirlwinds, etc. 25. And in this one we see a curious thing, this is from the middle of the 18th century, before Cook's voyages, what is not known is invented, in fact this piece is not known and this does not connect with Australia, the coast of Australia is still here, this is Tasmania, the island of Tasmania and neither is this. The Torres Strait was discovered in 1604 by a Spaniard, Torres, but they didn't say anything, so the English and the Dutch still thought it was closed. But then the English, in a plunder in Manila, got hold of a nautical chart and 150 years later they discovered that the Torres Strait existed and that the Spanish had known about it for a long time. Cook's voyages arrived, he made four voyages, I mean, he mapped the American coast, what was left, he also passed Hawaii and he made a zigzag route very far south, to rule out the existence of any land mass on the southern continent and from then on, in the 19th century. The world was known more or less as we know it now. 26. In the 19th century, Antarctica and the polar regions began to be explored, and this is an example of a very beautiful Mercator projection chart, this one from 1871 with the ocean currents, I'm not getting into this, but they had a great influence on the explorations, in other words, the explorations were for physical reasons what they were, because the currents in the northern hemisphere turn clockwise and in the southern hemisphere counterclockwise due to a physical question, the Coriolis acceleration. So, by throwing a stick, something that floated from here, from the Canary Islands, 
you could reach America and return if you found the latitude. I don't go into Urdanita's voyage which, in short, was to discover the same thing, when the Kuroshivo current returned and reached here. Well, this is an example of the world as we know it in the 19th century. 27. And now to finish the exhibition, the ecumenical is not only what can be seen on the surface, in the 1970s, from the 1950s onwards, with sonar, a map of the ocean floor was drawn up. And this map appears in the United States, of the whole world, where it can be seen that the ocean floor contains the ridges which, among other things, are what cause the movement of the plates and in the subduction zones, which are no coincidence and we have an unfortunate example these days, is where earthquakes occur. In other words, it is not by chance and there are volcanic areas such as the Canary Islands, where there are hot spots underneath that continue to produce earthquakes and in fact, in millions of years, we assume that there will be more Canary Islands. Because the plate is moving towards here, towards the east, the hot spot, it is like a lighter that is underneath and continues to create islands, because what is above, let's say a map that is moving and continues to create islands. 28. How does this quick tour end? Well, not so fast, it might have been a bit long. We know about the ecumene, but nobody has really seen it from space. That happens in 1968. In one of the missions, Apollo 8, one of the missions intended to reach the moon, without realizing it, because they didn't expect it, that mission was intended to reach the moon, orbit it and return, one of the steps prior to landing on the moon. And they don't fall into it, but when they are circling the moon, they realize that the earth is dawning, as if it were the sun, because they are rotating around the moon and the earth appears. In fact, the image that is iconic is the first image of our ecliamine from space, in 1968, taken by an Apollo 8 astronaut, which is this. This is where you really see what the Earth looks like from the outside, globally. And well, the image is called the same as sunrise, it means sunrise of the sun in English, this is the Earthrise. The sunrise of the Earth and it is an iconic photo, because it is the first time that the Earth is seen from space. And well, that's it, I'm done. Well, I hope you liked it, here it will continue to be explained in detail, because I have gone very quickly, it is all written here, there is documentation, the diptych, catalog, etc., it is available for download on the IGN website. And for us, well, it is a pleasure and an honor to be here and to do this Basque tour that we are doing, we are in San Sebastian, we are coming to Vitoria, we will go to Bilbao, God willing, so nothing, here it is for you to enjoy it.